there's nothing like a serious crisis to spur innovation. Just like the end of the First and the Second World War gave rise to a renaissance of activity, of perspectives, cultures and ideas, a new lease of life for people. So the world war on the virus and our gradual exit from it is a massive opportunity for us all to recreate ourselves and our organisations with fresh thinking. Milton Friedman, the Nobel economist, said that only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are available at the time. There is no doubt that we're in an actual crisis now. So let's do everything we can to take something positive out of it. Because we're now at a critical juncture where we can do one of two things. We can ignite and innovate our way out of this crisis, like Tesla taking off with their space program. Or you can fizzle out, just like these massive brands that went bankrupt since the virus hit. Ignoring the need to, to innovate is simply not an option because exposing the failure of those unwilling to recreate themselves has been a sadly poignant reality of the virus. It's going to continue. With all the adversity and challenges that are facing us, it really is that stark. If you don't fully culturally commit to keep creating, the chances of your organisation or indeed of your own career being around and thriving in 10 years time are slashed. The Confederation for British Industry has told us that 90% of us are going to need to find fundamentally new skills in the next nine years. A big reason for that is artificial intelligence. It's going to continue to chase us humans, compete with our skills, with its analysis and process, its efficiency, its speed, ease, decreased cost. It's massive scale. They're going to continue to strengthen. But the ability to innovate, to strategize, to develop relationships are some of our biggest advantages to ensure that our jobs are boosted and not consumed by technology. If you like what you do, you've got to use those skills. In fact, going back to human innovation at its very earliest stages, anthropologists have consistently seen, through, almost without exception, that the tribes who survive are the ones that accept change and innovation, however hard, distasteful, and ugly it may be for them to do so. Those that haven't have simply ceased to exist. We're now in an age where the courage of people like this young lady addressing the UN on climate change at the age of 16 exposes the sheer tragic timidity of just resigning ourselves to conform. Well, I'm sorry if that all sounds a bit chilling, because here's where things get much better. I was lucky enough to work on some of the world's best loved films with the studios and well-known filmmakers and cast that made them. Movies are something a lot of people have come to rely on more recently for downtime in the last year. And I've seen that there is so much creative inspiration that we can all use from those iconic films and the people responsible for them. There's a mountain of scientific proof that we're usually much better at doing something when we're enjoying it. We can bring back passion and fun into our work through creativity. Crazy places are most often happy places. And on the other side, we simply can't be creative when we're under threat or we're scared of being shot down. And that means that 86% of ideas in the workplace stay silent, many of them due to self-doubt or fear of what others might think. Don't be one of them. Here's a film example of some really brave creativity. Think about that age of much loved and idolized superheroes. The guys with big muscles, serious expressions and unflinching coolness. And it would think about the guts and the huge risk that it took to green light Deadpool's shocking un PC one liners, his naked superhero bum for the first time. Why did they do that? It wasn't just to make the film more funny. They did it because the holy grail for any big film is to break free from the traditional audience associated with that type of film, bit sci-fi, action, horror, romantic comedy and dramatically expand your revenues by appealing to a much wider audience. Cutting humour brought more new audiences into superhero movies than they could have ever dreamed. Disney, in fact, recreated much of their studio fortunes on the success of Marvel and their, and their punchy, funny one-liners from people like Robert Downey Jr. The basic rationale on how to think creative, creatively is really simple. Because children are born with natural open door thinking, big wide imaginations. 
And as we get older, we're banged over the head with schools, rules, regulations, laws. We start to think in channels and confines within strict boundaries, especially in big organisations. And instead of expanding our ideas like kids, we reduce them down and look for weaknesses so that we don't look silly in front of other people. That environment has led us to what I call train track thinking. We visit the same stops along the line in our thought process and creativity. If we innovate, we tend to tweak and adapt, making things a little bit better here or there, when often what we really need to do is go beyond those tweaks into the much scarier world of really open door thinking to reevaluate what we're offering and how. I mean, daring to really take the handbrake off. That doesn't mean changing sector or leaving everything you're, you're good at and you've built up, but it does mean being brave enough to seriously reassess what you're doing for the chance to have a totally new and transformative level of performance. Walt Disney was brilliant at breaking free from those train tracks and thinking exponentially. He refused to accept the traditional rules and limits of animation. So he developed the multi-plane camera with parts of a scene on stacked frames to give the shot depth. He wanted scent sprayed onto people in key scenes. That was almost 80 years before 3D and 4DX were thought of. In fact, he's so obsessed did he become with plunging people into a film experience that he realised it needed to be live. Characters you could interact with on live sets where they lived. Suddenly Disneyland was born. And that was a legitimate game changer that introduced the multi-billion dollar concept of the theme park into the world. That was pretty great open door innovation. In fact, years later, when I was working for Disney, we helped turn it back the other way with one of their most popular theme park rides and turn that into a multi-billion dollar film franchise with Jack Sparrow the Pirate. Here's another rule filmmaking chose to ignore to its benefit. Cars in movies had to have two axles and amongst other things they had to be finished in spray paint and lacquer. They look cool with lots of fun gadgets, the Bond cars, the Back to the Future car, nice incremental thinking. And when I was starting out at Warner Brothers, Chris Nolan and Nathan Crowley refused to accept this with the rebirth of Batman in the Dark Knight trilogy. They created a totally new Batmobile in Chris's garage using a plastic toy model kit with tons of unthought of accessories. I'd have looked something like this in the, the early stages. But on a much simpler level, it also had no front axle at all and was finished in matte black paint. They fundamentally rethought the look and design of the crowd classic Batmobile and, ha and came to, gave birth to one of the most iconic movie vehicles of all time. That was exponential open door thinking. I asked if we could tour this crazy vehicle to lots of key events and we publicised the hell out of it. By The Dark Knight, the second film, the film, it took the biggest box office of all time in the US. And soon, lots of the world's private, privately owned supercars Lo and behold, they soon sported matte black paint and even flaming tailpipes like the Batmobile. Global culture had been pervaded and taken off the tracks. Do you often sometimes feel tired at the end of a day and that you've got through stuff, but that you haven't really challenged your brain? You haven't really used it properly. That's because we only use 13% of our brain for getting, getting through much of our working day. It's that part of our brain that we use to be efficient, move fast, just get stuff done. 82% of our brain is subconscious, and that's the bit where the ideas come from. The reason I call it open door thinking is that a bigger route to getting truly creative is opening that door to the bigger creative part of our brain. Psychologists have proved this time and time again. So that efficiency keeps us within the lines and stops us from accessing our creativity. In fact, we become so used to the confines of the lights that they become invisible and we don't even know they're there anymore. We stay in these familiar areas of thinking inside the lines where we feel safe and happy. For those of us on comfortable salaries that allow us to continue doing what we've done even more so. So much going on, you can very rarely be creative in this executional get stuff done mode. Think about it. Are you really comfortable accepting that you're only using such a small part of your brain for most of your day? Here's another example of daring to be really new. Animated films had to be for children traditionally. Snow White the Seven Dwarfs was Walt's first animated feature movie in 1937. But even he didn't know everything. Pixar and Toy Story broke the mould with adult humour in animation. 
Remember when Buzz Lightyear's wings pop out uncontrollably from behind his back when he first sees Bo Peep for the first time? It was just a little bit naughty, but it was also a very big, brave move from Disney, who was so married to that traditional Puritan family audience that went to see animated movies. But that shift allowed them to multiply by several times the size of the audience going to see animated films, meaning that they now regularly surpass a billion dollars at the box office. That changed traditional animated films and their profitability forever. And PS had also made Pixar into a multi-billion dollar company in a few years. Also, think of Joker. It's a film I was lucky enough to work on. Another legitimate creative groundbreaker about terrible mental illness, destitution and rejection by society. It's the total antithesis of other the glamour, glamorous superhero films in that genre. But there's another point to make from this image. Just as the Joker's forcing himself here, when you first have a proper go at creativity and really go for exponential thinking, it's hard. It's probably going to feel a bit forced. Incremental thinking is much easier and leads to quicker short-term results. With really open, exponential open-door thinking, you're going to go through a much harder period where you can't see what your idea can become and what the next logical step might be. And a lot of people find that hard. They get beaten down quickly. Something means that often that 90% of the brilliance can come in the, in the last 10% of the time that you spend thinking about it. So many amazing films that we saw over the years like this one had constant fundamental changes to the structure and others even changing to changes to the leading cast. And that took them from being on-screen challenges into the legendary movies that they become in the same process. So here's the 10 tips to bring out your creative demon and access that big creative part of your brain I keep talking about. It's clinically proven that our brains are neuroplastic and we, they can be creative if we push them that way. First up, believe you can do it. Socrates felt, thought that he had some kind of spiritual demon that would come to him. The Renaissance put humans at the centre of everything. The inspiration would come to them. Well, now the thinking is much more accepted that you have got to make it happen. That inspiration demon will come, but you've got to proactively open the door and tempt in by believing in yourself. In innovation is not going to hit us passively. We have to go after it with ambition. Really want to win and pursue it like we mean it. Number two, be yourself. Commit emotionally. When you're developing ideas, be truly you, because fortunately we're all boldly different. Bring your head and your heart together, accepting that you're all going to come up with different stuff. Focus on your strengths and use them to your advantage as you build ideas. Accept that we're all gonna develop ideas in lots of different ways, in groups, on our own. Find your way, let your colleagues go theirs. Quiet or noisy, adrenaline, calm, because coming up with ideas can be very unpredictable and we all need our own personal ways of developing them. We've all got our own idiosyncrasies. Einstein even said, it's important to foster individuality because only the individual can produce new ideas. Number three, bosses, watch out. Because to feel inspired, we've got to feel confident that we've got the support of our colleagues and the people above us. To be bold and cut through, we need to take risks and go through that I can't see uncomfortable bit. In film, like a lot of industries, 90% of profits can often come from 5 or 10% of what goes into the market. That therefore means that the other 90% have got, a lot, have got to have a lot of failures. We've got to be allowed to fail because it's, that's necessary to get to the gold. And that all needs to be backed up by spirit, dynamism and empowered decision taking rather than months of admin approvals and corporate watering down that kills ideas. Learn from those cool, fast, small, agile, darting little fish that can't be caught and act like them with nimble, bold decisions. Number four, make time to think. It's basic, but 50% of us spend less than 30 minutes, 6% of the working week thinking. Make some limited time in your lunch break for, or another time for focus with less noise. And that means looking out from your, from your cell phone. Power down to be able to focus. The digital was great for sharing and inspiring ideas, but it's also not great for noise and distraction. Number five, get comfortable being uncomfortable. This is Theresa May here, coming on stage to the Dancing Queen. Unfortunately, not a great move for her career at the time, but excited nervousness and discomfort is often a really good sign because it, it's a clear idea that the, that the idea is refreshingly different. We're leaving those train tracks. And that's a good thing, even if it feels uneasy. Number six, competition is good. But in ideation, it's got to be friendly competition, legitimate encouragement. 
Too much of it, and it can focus on shooting down good thinking and building barriers. Lots of people focus too much on trying to just get their own idea across. We all want to use our own ideas, but an idea can't be owned by just one individual or its chances of survival and getting through plunge. The team have got to feel like they've contributed and have a consequential role to play because lots of people are privately asking themselves what's in it for me when they're thinking about an idea. You may have to convince others, in fact, that it was their idea to get it through. Number seven, ground your thinking in really solid consumer insight that builds a really clear brief prior to ideating. Make sure that your brief truly responds to what your customer wants or risk your creative brilliance going unguided and unused. Think through the eyes of your customer. Would you commit or buy that idea if you were in their shoes? The ideas have got to have a launch pad. A totally blank canvas is a much harder and diff more difficult place to start. And good consumer research, research is the right way to found that, that briefing process. Number eight, develop positive inertia. This is Jim Carrey in a film called Yes Man, where his character had to say yes to everything. Say yes and when you're developing ideas. And that's much more than stopping no's in a session. It doesn't mean saying something's great when you don't believe it. But do allow an idea to build in a group. Bad ideas sometimes, quite often build into something really brilliant that in no way resembles the original. Rationalise the idea another time, but if you don't build an idea at its inception, it's going to stop your chances of striking gold. Number nine, mix with others from lots of different skills and department. That creates these, what a lot of people call creative collisions. Sometimes we're just too close to our own work to see through and things that should have been extremely obvious are pointed out by someone that has nothing to do with our line of work. People call them uninformed geniuses, naive experts. It's those moments when someone says something so basic that you think you might have thought about, or in fact, it's something that you thought that you thought of about three or four years ago, but you actually need to reconsider again. Maybe it's a great idea. Organise coffees with people in other departments. It's going to help both of you. Harrison Ford was one of those. He was an on-set carpenter and an extra who kept suggesting great ideas. And that goes also into the variety of people in the room exchanging ideas. Just as a, a film can't have a cast of, made up of entirely action heroes, we need loads of different people to give different points of view, people from different races, backgrounds or ages, lots of people to share the ideas. At Warner Brothers, we often have 30, up to 30% of our teams are made up of interns, younger people to give our thinking fr a fresh edge and keep it relevant. Should the most experienced person in the room be actually running the brainstorm? Take turns. Number 10, change your physical environment to change and refresh your thinking. Physical exercise, going on walks, coming away from your usual surroundings, it reboots the creative flow and lets that subconscious brain open up. If you're brainstorming about a specialist area or a product, put yourself in it if you can. Filmmakers often say that their set helps spur their thinking. Einstein was in a boat when he saw how relativity worked. Da Vinci sat by a stream. Tesla saw the electric motor in his head while he was in a park. And Joe Rowling was in a coffee shop in Edinburgh when she created the story of a neglected little boy, recruited from his cupboard under the stairs to Hogwarts Castle, one of the most powerful entertainment franchises of all time, thought up in this neighbourhood cafe. And lastly, whatever you do, have fun, because you really don't have to be serious to solve serious issues. Ideating is uplifting. It's enjoyable. Let's do more of it. Because without good ideas, a truly chilling, terrible and icy cold thing is likely to happen to you, your product or your organisation. Nothing.